my name is Andrew Suskind, and for those of you who um, haven't met me and I haven't had the opportunity to meet, I am a licensed clinical social worker out here in Los Angeles. I've been in practice since 1992, and I really come here uh, to this presentation for personal and professional reasons, but uh, today's presentation will be a blend because I really don't separate the two anymore. I believe that uh, today's presentation is really based on my personal and professional experience. So you'll, you'll understand that more as we go into our material today. Um, I've been a member of SASH for many years. I believe wholeheartedly in SASH and its mission. And I also um, have been in recovery myself since 1994. So um, like I said, this is something that comes from my heart and I look forward to sharing the time with you tonight. And although it's in webinar form, I really want you to uh, be sure to ask questions in the chat box so that when we break for questions that I can address anything that comes up for you. So feel free to use that, the chat function and uh, we'll get started from there. So to begin with today, many of you may have heard this, this quote before, but the quote goes like this, the opposite of addiction is, is, isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And this quote comes from a gentleman named Johan Hari. And Johan Hari did a TED talk several years ago that I highly recommend, by the way. It's less than 15 minutes and it's really well done. And I really resonated with, with him when I heard his idea about how really, we're, when we're talking about addictive compulsive behaviors, we're not just talking about behaviors, we're talking about attachment, attachment ruptures, attachment repair. And that's really where this whole um, presentation stem from, is that idea that although there's behavioral aspects to working on sexual sobriety and other types of sobriety, really what I believe helps us with sustainable recovery is establishing connection. And we're gonna be talking about connection in, in many different ways today, but that's where we're gonna start, okay? So that is our uh, title, the opposite of sexual compul compulsivity is connection. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna start off by discussing what brokenheartedness is all about. Then we're going to segue into emotional sobriety once we finish with emotional sobriety, we're gonna talk about regulating the nervous system. And, and then we're gonna have a second q and I'm actually gonna have a Q&A after the emotional sobriety piece and after the nervous system piece. So that's gonna be our, our time together today. Okay, so why do I put my grandmother and my childhood dog on the first slide. You might imagine for a moment that you grew up in a home that was less than nurturing, a home that might have been emotionally violent or maybe even other types of violence, and to say the least, turbulent and chaotic. Well, this was my home, unfortunately. I grew up in a home where I believe we tried to love one another, but we really didn't know how to love one another. And from an early age, I actually became a heat-seeking missile. And when I talk about myself as a heat-seeking missile, it means that I, I looked everywhere for love. I looked everywhere for acceptance. I looked everywhere for validation from the time I was a little kid, as far back as I can remember. Now, my grandmother, who's standing here on the Atlantic City boardwalk, I grew up in a suburb outside of Philadelphia, she was the epitome of unconditional love. She loved me so thoroughly that I sometimes didn't know what to do with all the love because it was so different than 
in my home. And I was really, really lucky because she moved to New Jersey, to our suburb um, of Philadelphia, when I went, started kindergarten. So actually the very first day of kindergarten, my grandmother moved to New Jersey. So that was an incredible stroke of luck. She had been in Brooklyn for many years, but needed to, um, wanted to live closer to my mother actually. And, and so I was so lucky to have my grandmother. Her, her name was Rose and she truly was uh, a Rose. She was just um, a light in, in the midst of some darkness. <clears throat> and to the right of Rose, I wanna introduce you to my childhood dog, Nikki. N-I-K-K-I, and, and Nikki was a brown and white Siberian Husky with a clover leaf pattern on his forehead. And you can't quite see it in the picture because this is from 1973, I believe, but he had two different color eyes. So he was a beautiful dog. And in, in spite of all of the craziness going on at home, somehow he was like, a, re a sanctuary for me. You know, I would take him to my room with me. I would take him on walks. In the winter time, he would pull the sled. Um, Huskies really do instinctually know how to pull sleds. It's, it's amazing. And so I bring Nikki and Rose into this conversation because they were my touchstones. They were my experience of deeper connection. And so even though there was a lot of brokenheartedness in my home and in my family, there was also some unconditional love. And I raise this with you because you can always ask someone the question, when you were growing up, were there any emotionally reliable people in your life? When you were growing up, were there any emotionally reliable people in your life? And I can point well, people or pets, that is. I can point to, to Nikki and Rose because they were, what can I say? They, they helped me make it through my childhood. And when we ask somebody and they're, they're able to identify someone, that's a resource. That's something inside of them that they've internalized and that they always can carry with them. And, and it's actually a really good sign for healing and for recovery. But if you ask somebody if they had somebody in their childhood who is emotionally reliable and they say no, guess what? It's an indication that, that they're going to have an uphill battle. Not that they can't heal, not that they can't recover, but it's going to be much more difficult for them to find the kind of um, connection and secure attachment as an adult, okay? So the last thing I, I want to say about my grandmother and my dog is that there, there's something when, when I'm talking about them right now that warms my heart, literally. And we're going to be talking about the nervous system in our second half. And I think that's probably why I put them on the first slide is because it regulates my nervous system. And in order to find deeper connection within ourselves, it's so vital that we regulate our nervous system. So anything that's regulating, in this case, Nikki and Rose, um, that's what we're always looking for. Doesn't matter who we are, whether we're in recovery, not in recovery, how do we feel more regulated in spite of a sometimes dysregulated world that we live in, okay? All right. So let's see. Brokenheartedness. When I was writing my book a few years ago, I really did not want to pathologize um, sexual compulsivity. I didn't want to um, create a sense of shame or right or wrong. Okay, just a second here. There we go. Um, I even though diagnostically, I can talk about just about anything. When I'm talking about addictive compulsive behaviors, I don't want to pathologize. I don't want to diagnose. I don't want to even categorize. But what I came up with was this idea that all of us are brokenhearted. And brokenheartedness is very similar to trauma, but I consider brokenheartedness to be even more of an umbrella 
on, on what we each go through when it comes to uh, recovery. Hold on a second. I'm just going to get rid of, um, there we go. All right, just had to get rid of the thumbnail of myself. I don't want to be watching myself as I'm talking. So, um, so what I came up with was the following. Trauma, as many of us know, can be something very specific, like an actual event that's traumatic, or it can be developmental, developmental or relational, which is the interpersonal kinds of traumas that we sometimes experience. As we know, there's also all kinds of abuse out there, whether it be sexual, physical, emotional, religious abuse, right? And so all kinds of abuse result in brokenheartedness. The same with neglect, right? Sometimes neglect is intentional and sometimes it's really unintentional or benign. I'll give you an example, like somebody, uh, somebody was telling me about their parents who were just working like two jobs each and just were hardly ever at home. And they had people come in and look after them, babysitters and nannies and whatnot. But that's an example of neglect, even though it's not malicious, it's not really intentional, it's just circumstantial, okay? And then of course there's abandonment, right? Where a parent actually leaves a child, in child intentionally, where they just take off because they can't deal with it anymore. Or there's emotional abandonment where a parent just doesn't know how to connect with the child, right? So that's another type of abandonment. And lastly, grief and loss show up generally when we're talking about a death or a goodbye. Like I'll give you an example. Let's say you had a best friend as a kid and then suddenly their parents decided that they're gonna move. That's brokenheartedness, especially when you have that trust and that experience of really being yourself with someone and then they're plucked away and maybe are difficult to um, reach, or at least at the time that I was growing up, we had to pick up the phone and try and contact someone, but it's heartbreaking, right? I had a friend who his family uh, was in the military. So they, they went all around the world and we tried to keep in touch because we were best friends when we were really little, but it's just not easy. So that, there is some brokenheartedness there for sure. So again, what I'm really talking about is anything that, that leaves us feeling heartbreak, trauma, abuse, neglect, abandonment, any type of grief and loss. So once upon a time, when I was a newer clinician, I used to think that brokenheartedness was always a predecessor to somebody who is dealing with some kind of addictive compulsive tendencies. I used to think there had to be some kind of heartbreak. There had to be some kind of trauma. Now, I'm gonna give you a quick example of where this is not always the case. As many of you know, porn, compulsive porn use is, is just epidemic among teenagers. Um, unfortunately, the, the the brain gets hijacked and sometimes not for every teenager, but for many teenagers, they get hooked very quickly on porn and some of them can't stop, right? There, there was a really great definition. I don't know if any of you remember the um, documentary, What the Bleep Do We Know? But there was a scientist who was being interviewed in, in that film and he said, they said to him, what's the definition of addiction? How would you put it simply, not in a non-scientific way? And he said, addiction is when you wanna stop, but you can't. And I, I thought, oh my goodness, that, that is a fantastic definition. It's when you wanna stop, but you can't, right? So I mentioned that because that's what often happens when porn takes over. And sometimes I'll talk to a teenager or a young adult and I'll try and find out what kind of trauma was there before they started with the porn. And sometimes they can identify different types of brokenheartedness and sometimes they can't. 
sometimes their background was actually very kind of um, normal, even though I don't like the term normal, um, but, but it was uneventful, let's say. And then the porn came into their life and they just went off to the races with it. So I say all of that to remind you that addictive compulsive tendencies don't always indicate uh, a, a broken heartedness or trauma beforehand. But as I say here, whether it's the cause or the effect of addictive compulsive behaviors, broken heartedness is a form of invisible suffering, right? We don't see it, it's invisible. So, so broken heartedness can be before the sexual compulsion or it can show up, of course, after. So sometimes, sometimes broken heartedness comes from childhood pain. Sometimes it can be a result of the addictive process or the compulsive process. And sometimes it can be simply a result of circumstance. So the main reason I wanted to share this particular slide is because there's no one size fits all. And once upon a time, I thought that there had to be trauma and brokenheartedness in order for there to be some kind of addictive compulsive um, process, but it's just not the case. So let's move on to what I call an antidote to brokenheartedness. Now, I want you to take a look, a close look at this image, right? I, I believe this is a mom and her son, okay? And this is what I make up about it anyway. I, I make up that the son is really trusting of his mom and can relax in her lap. That he looks really interested in maybe her telling a story or showing him pictures. But whatever is happening there, there's something that looks really easy and loving, right? And one thing that we know is that when we feel trusting of a person or of our environment, our nervous system relaxes. It's automatic. If we trust, we relax. And if we find that we're relaxing with someone, means that we're trusting. So it goes in both directions. So what we're going to be talking about in today's discussion about brokenheartedness is that the antidote is really about intimacy, right? Sometimes we hear compulsive sex called an intimacy disorder. I don't use the term disorder very often, but it's certainly an intimacy gap or an intimacy rupture for sure. But what we're looking for in terms of healing the broken heart is we're looking about building intimacy, building connection, and not just any connection, but deeper, meaningful connection, developing and deepening emotionally reliable relationships, attunement, which in this picture, by the way, this is a beautiful example of attunement, right? They're both kind of in the same relational field and, and there's a sense that they're really, really together and that mom is really paying attention to what is giving this child pleasure, right? So attunement can be in the relationship and attunement can be in the nervous system or in the neurobiological attunement. And then the last thing, and this kind of comes in a way from Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, but I believe that my own journey and many journey of, of people in, in program and in healing uh, from sexual compulsivity are really learning how to give and receive love freely. And what that means to me, it's like opening that channel and feeling safe enough, right? Safe enough to give love freely and to receive love freely. Okay, so those are the antidotes to brokenheartedness. All right, so let's talk a little bit about disconnection. We've all heard these things before, 
How many of you hear people say things such as, no matter what I do, I can't seem to relax. I'm constantly anxious, like I'm crawling out of my skin. When I'm stressed, the first thing I think of is acting out. I know it's not what I really want to do, but it will give me temporary relief. So these are things that, that generally people in, in all stages of recovery say at one time or another, or those who maybe are still in some kind of compulsive cycle, but are identifying that something's wrong here. No matter what I do, I can't seem to relax, for instance, or not feeling comfortable in one's skin, or just wanting to act out when there's just too many feelings or feeling overwhelmed. So these are all examples of disconnection. Now, in my book, I, I interviewed six people with longer term recovery from sexual compulsivity. And I asked them this question because I think this question captures some of what describes emotional sobriety. And I'm gonna talk more about emotional sobriety in a moment. But the question is this, when do you feel most like yourself? And Susan said, when I'm creatively expressive, when I'm writing, singing, dancing, doing artwork. Robert said, while taking a long walk, being out in nature. And Alex feels most like himself when he says meditation is a reset button for me. A lot of times I get into a trance of suffering and then when I wanna act out, but when I meditate, it's like I see it. I see what I'm doing and it's painfully obvious. It, it wakes me up. And Colin says, when I'm consistently working my program and using the tools, when I'm not making somebody else or my job my higher power, when I'm with a friend who sees me and supports me and can, can be present with me, now keep in mind that the question, when do you feel most like yourself is, is very subjective, right? But each of us generally knows when we ask ourselves, when do I feel most like myself? Like for me, if I'm able to sit and relax and read a book, hopefully a good novel or something that, that's really for pleasure, not for work, um, that's when I know I'm feeling most like myself, right? So. I want you just to take a moment and, and just think to yourself, what, when do you feel most like yourself? It might be a place that you visit. It might be a particular relationship that you enjoy, but just check in with yourself and, and see when do you feel most like yourself? And as you do that, that's really a, a way to check in with, am I feeling emotionally sober, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So this is interesting because I just moved into a new office this week and I was going through a lot of papers, like papers that I've had literally for almost 30 years and that I've dragged around me to different offices. And anyway, I don't have to go on. You get the idea of a little bit of a pack rat, but, but I went, was going through papers and I found something that I thought was fascinating because I hadn't looked at this in, in years. It was actually given to me by my therapist. And number four is called the seven pathways. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But I used to say that the, the main ways that I think about connection, the primary ways for me are connection to myself, connection to others, and connection to a higher power, which I happen to call God. Now, as this whole presentation is about connection, really, we're looking at ways to connect on a, in a sustainable way really 24 seven, right? Because I know if I'm feeling connected, my life is going more smoothly. If I feel disconnected, I, I'm gonna run into some bumpiness, right? I'm going to maybe get anxious 
or I'm going to be more um, in automatic pilot rather than more mindful of what I'm doing in my day. So my shortcut, by the way, for connection has always been these three things, my therapist, my sponsor, and my God. And that's not in any particular order. They all are important to me. But my therapist, my sponsor, and God really make up my, my trifecta of connection, OK? But like I told you, I ran into this worksheet this week called The Seven Pathways to Connection. So I wanted to share this with you because I thought it was so perfect for today's uh, presentation. I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but I'm going to just tell you what the seven pathways are. And you tell me what you think, if you have any comments or questions at our halfway point. So number one, connection to the soul, the deeper self, the spirit. I'll say that again, connection to the soul, the deeper self, the spirit. That's number one. Number two, connection through the body. Connection through the body. Number three, connection to another. Number four, connection to community. Connection to community, which could be a 12-step community. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your church or synagogue, all kinds of possibilities. Number five is connection through nature. Connection through nature. Number six, connection by participating in making or appreciating art. I love this one because I, I used to be a musician. I guess I still am, but I haven't played in a long time. And um, I really appreciate music a lot. I mean, I hope we all do in different ways, but I, I, I really appreciate classical music in particular because my father used to listen to classical music all the time. And I, when I turn on the classical station in my car or at home, it's my connection to my dad, but it's, all connect, it's also a connection to my past and my history. So number six, connection by participating in making or appreciating art. And the last one is connection to the universe or higher power or God or cosmic consciousness. I'll say that again, connection to the universe or higher power or God or cosmic consciousness. So I don't know about you, but I, I really think I need to revise this slide because I think this seven pathways are beautiful and very thorough. So I appreciate you listening to me talk about the seven pathways because I think it really, it creates even more dimensional um, ideas around what connection truly is and what it can be for each of us. I'm sure many of you have heard the term emotional sobriety and there's a lot of different ways of looking at emotional sobriety. And there's not, in my opinion, a right or wrong about how people describe it. Uh, there's some great books out there. There's some folks who, who are talking about emotional sobriety quite consistently. This is just my approach. So as always, take what you like and leave the rest. But this is what I came up with as part of my soul searching and observation of clients for many years. So emotional sobriety is the capacity, the capacity to experience the fullness of life. And what I'm talking about there is both the internal life and the external life, okay? The capacity to experience the fullness of life. It's also a resilient, resourceful, regulated state of well being. Now, resiliency, resourcefulness, and regulation are all borrowed from the language of the nervous system. And I use them intentionally, number one, because I love the alliteration, but because I think that's so powerful to even consider the idea that we can be resilient, resourceful, and regulated at any given moment. And if we somehow <clears throat> get dysregulated, that really our work, our healing work, is to move back to regulation more efficiently. 
because that's where our sense of well-being, our sense of balance, and our overall wellness really exists. Okay. And then what I mentioned before is emotional sobriety is also about when you feel most like yourself or comfortable in your own skin. And again, this is very subjective, but in a way, this is homework if you haven't thought about it already to really ask yourself, when do I feel most like myself? And am I participating in life in a way that allows me to feel most like myself more of the time? It's not like we can be there all the time. But are we observing life or are we participating in life? Are we truly comfortable in our own skin or are we somehow tolerating what's going on in, in our bodies, right? And I was at a conference not too long ago um, in Cape Cod, the Cape, Cape Cod Symposium for Addictive Disorders. And somebody mentioned the word recurrence. And I thought this is a fantastic word because I never really liked the word relapse because it, 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 it captures something, I think, in the drug and alcohol world. But I think in sexual compulsivity, I, I really am striving for a different language. And so my belief is that emotional sobriety, if we're more emotionally so sober, it will reduce our vulnerability to recurrence of sexual acting out or sexual, sexually compulsive type behaviors, right? So it reduces the vulnerability to recurrence. And I'm gonna talk more about that again later. All right, so I came up with what I call the four R's of emotional sobriety. And again, Bear with my alliteration, but for some reason I can't keep landing on ours. And this is what I came up with. Relax, regulate, respond, relate. Okay, and I've shared some of this already, but I'm gonna go down each of them more specifically. So when I'm talking about relaxation, I'm not talking about vegging in front of the TV, watching Netflix. Not that there's anything wrong with that, in moderation, but I'm talking about the art of relaxation. And I really do believe that relaxation is an art. And I'm trying with, with at this um, point in my life, I'm doing my very best to try and plug in more relaxation because I tend to be on the go. I tend to be a list maker and I tend to get distracted with things that often don't allow me to relax. So, what I'm talking about when I'm mentioning relaxation is I'm really talking about physiological changes, right? And we all know what they are. It's, it's when our uh, heart rate goes down. It's when our, our pulse is quieter. It's, it's, it's everything in, in the autonomic nervous system that, that's in sort of that rest and digest mode. And so I want you to just think for a moment about how you're doing in this category. How are you truly relaxing? I, I put meditation in this category as well. And my therapist is, is really wanting me to <clears throat> increase the amount of minutes that I meditate. I've been meditating almost daily for, for about 10 minutes. And he's really wanted me to push to 20 minutes minimum. So I'm at 15, so I'm, I'm up for the challenge, but I, I think there's something about mindfully asking yourself, what kind of relaxation are you truly plugging into your, your day, right? Regulation, which we're, we're gonna be talking about in our second half is really describing the nervous system, right? The term re regulation for me wasn't even on my radar until about maybe 15 years ago. And so the idea of regulation and dysregulation is really something that we all can do. It takes practice, it takes diligence, but it's really about finding that zone, that, that zone where we can truly be ourselves, right? And where our system is really balanced 
and where we really truly can experience all of what life has to offer. That's, that's regulation. And then we move on to respond, responding. So many of you have probably heard the idea about responding rather than reacting. So I'll give you an example. Somebody says something to you that feels shaming. And the automatic reaction is to avoid, to go away, to shut down. Not that I know anything about those things, but, but we, it's common, right? If we feel shame, often we, we crawl under our shell. That's a common response. But responding to something like that is, it's really about checking in with yourself. It's being able to take a breath, literally to take a breath or two. Responding is about mindfully noticing where we are, like grounding ourselves, orienting ourselves, um, knowing that, um, that that was an external kind of, uh, might, might feel like an attack verbally in a way. But, but responding also is about knowing when to say something and when not to say something. Sometimes I get defensive when, when I feel shamed and I, and I wanna re react really quickly. In that case, one way of responding is to bite my tongue, right? I'm, I'm a big advocate for biting my tongue and, and for you considering to bite your tongue because when we react, there's no space. And what we're looking for in responding is just a moment or two, maybe a few seconds, so that we don't have to go right into reactivity, right? That reactivity is the dysregulation, responding is a more regulated place, which we'll talk about later. And then lastly, we already talked about relate and the three areas that I mentioned, the trifecta of connection for me is connection to, to self, connection to others, and connection to God. And so I'm really talking about emotionally dependable people or entities. So relax, regulate, respond, and relate. All righty. So in my book, I wrote some what I call composite case studies. And what I mean by that is, even though I call it the story of Jason, this is not about a particular person. It's about a kind of a hybrid of different clients I've known through the years. And this particular story really describes emotional sobriety. So I'm going to read this to you. And it goes like this. Jason is a 32-year-old straight single male who is devoted to working his program on a daily basis. He's attended meetings for more than a year and his life is much better for it. He's been able to hold a full-time job, he spends time with program friends, and he's sexually sober, but he doesn't feel emotionally sober. I work the steps, I have a sponsor, and I am a sponsor, yet I still don't feel comfortable in my own skin, he admits. Despite the connections he's made at meetings, Jason remains isolated at times, socially awkward and anxious. It's this state of dysregulation that calls for somatic awareness, self-regulation, and the tracking of what's causing his unease. Jason also needs to think carefully about his past. Where did his nervousness come from? Growing up in a wealthy family and educated at a private school, Jason may appear at first glance to have had everything. His parents were both absent though. Dad worked endless hours as a trial attorney and mom immersed herself in community organizations and social events. Most of Jason's time was spent with the nanny, leaving him starved for the love and attention of his parents. When he went away to boarding school, he learned that his father had engaged in multiple affairs and soon thereafter, his parents went through a contentious divorce. Jason had all the material possessions he could want, but had felt utterly abandoned from a young age. 
He never experienced unconditional love or acceptance from his parents, the two people he most wanted to understand him. As a teen, he was moody and depressed. Feeling helpless, he didn't see how things could get any better, and that's when he discovered porn. Being emotionally abandoned at such a young age, in addition to the secrets and lies surrounding his father's infidelities, made trusting others a serious risk for Jason. But he realizes now that relying on dependable people is essential to living an emotionally sober life. My therapist and my sponsor are totally reliable, he says. I've learned to ask for help and they're always there for me. I feel like a work in progress and I'm more hopeful than before. Even my moods seem to be evening out and sometimes I catch myself feeling gratitude and contentment. So one of the themes that Jason highlights is trust, right? Because in a way he was emotionally abandoned at a young age. He, he wanted desperately to have the attachment, the connection, the closeness with his parents and they were just off being busy. And so his experience of trust and feeling like people were really going to be there with him was an uphill battle. But if you remember the picture from before of the child, the, the, the young boy in the mom's lap, that's really what he was missing. And I want you to think for a moment, and this is really um, just an image, that didn't Jason really want to sit in his mom's lap? right? But, but she wasn't available for that. So in a way, nowadays, Jason really, really wants to be held. He's longing, longing for that kind of experience. He may never get that exactly from his mom, but he already feels comfortable enough with his sponsor and his therapist. So at least he's able to start to trust right, the, the planting the seeds of trust, and he's starting to relax and have a little bit of hope. So that's what I think emotional sobriety is, is all about. So here are some summary points just to make sure that I am covering everything um, effectively. Emotional sobriety actually cannot happen until somebody is sexually sober. So I, I'm assuming that everybody has a sense of what sexual sobriety is, but I'll just say briefly that it's really when someone is able to stop the destructive behaviors, right? They may be, you know, not perfect. That's not what uh, sexual sobriety is about. Um, they may be going through some trial and error to figure out what sexual sobriety is with their sponsor or with their therapist. Um, but until the, the destructive or self-destructive behaviors are out of the way, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to feel emotionally sober. Okay. And then we went over the four R's, right? The four R's. And what I want to remind you is that it's really a practice. It's not to, meant to be like a finite uh, cognitive understanding. To relax, to regulate, to respond, and to relate. These four R's, if, if any of us can do this on a regular basis, um, we're doing pretty damn well. And so this is a practice and hopefully it's, it can be a daily practice for all of us. And like I said, emotional sobriety, I believe, and I haven't run any studies, I'm not a researcher, um, I'm not an academic, but I believe that the more emotional sobriety we have, the more we're working these tools, there's less vulnerability to recurrence of any kind of sexually compulsive behaviors, right? Hopefully that makes sense to you. And lastly, I just wanna say that emotional sobriety is, is really for everyone. 
it's not just for those in recovery from sexual compulsivity. It's not just for those in recovery from addictions. It's really something that everyone can benefit from. And I love the idea of emotional sobriety. I'm actually playing with the words because I'm constantly looking at semantics and what words fit. But I'm trying to come up with something else. Like I've been playing with the idea of emotional resilience, which may be part of emotional sobriety. Anyway, I, um, I'd be open to hearing any ideas or thoughts on that, but emotional sobriety actually was developed in the addictions field. So um, that's where the term comes from. So with that said, I think we're gonna open it up yeah, for, for any questions that might be out there. And I'm open to questions, comments, or uh, weather reports, anything that you'd like to share. Well, the weather, well, the weather in um, um, Georgia, Georgia is, is raining. raining. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. And so I don't know if anyone has anything that they want to throw out there while we're we're sort of chatting here, or if there is uh, something you want to throw into the chat, um, but there aren't any in the Q&A right now. Okay. okay. I'm just going to... Great so far. Thank you. Oh, sure. Why don't we just give anybody a moment to, uh, to write anything they'd like, because I really would love to hear from you if, if anybody has any questions. Say... Someone would like you to spell Johan Hari's name so that oh, they can sure. look that up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Johan is J O H A N N. So it looks like Johan, but it's J O H A N N. And then the last name is Hari, H A R I. And I think you can bring up the TED Talk also through um, the name, The Opposite of Addiction uh, is Connection. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And I highly recommend, it's, it's very worthwhile to listen to him. He's a British, I can't remember what his background is, but he's, um, he's British and I think he's really put together a wonderful TED Talk. Okay. I don't see any other comments or questions, Andrew. Okay, very good. So we shall move on then. Um, let's see if I can bring back my PowerPoint. Okay. All righty. So was there one other question? I saw something else pop up in the chat. Uh, so thank you for acknowledging SLAA and the addiction recovery domain. That's how this person came to the awareness of SASH. Oh, my goodness. Welcome. Welcome. By the way, I believe that all of the S programs um, came to be for a purpose, and they all have value. Um, and I appreciate you being here tonight. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so, so moving on, we're going to talk about the nervous system, and I want to preface this by saying that, again, I'm not a researcher, I'm not an academic, I'm certainly not a, um, um, a neurobiologist or a neurophysiologist, but what I have come to believe strongly is that the nervous system is the frontier of the future. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that before the somatic psychology modalities uh, came to be, we didn't know how the body really fit into this whole healing uh, modality. And I'm talking in general about healing, but certainly about healing from compulsive sex. And <clears throat> um, I, I took a, a, a three-year training called somatic experiencing 
and the, the founder of somatic experiencing is Peter Levine. And I quote him here because I, I love this expression. He says that, um, that really what healing is about is restoring the wisdom of the nervous system, restoring the wisdom of the nervous system. And I, I, I love the idea that in a sense, when we're talking about healing the nervous system or regulating the nervous system, we're talking about rec reclaiming our birthright. Most of us come into the world, most of us, with a regulated nervous system. And so there's wisdom to that, right? Our, our bodies, our nervous system in innately knows what it's like to, to be regulated. And so when we experience brokenheartedness, we end up really impacting the nervous system and um, living in a lot of dysregulation, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. And so, as I said before, we all get dysregulated. There's nothing wrong with dysregulation, but when we live in it, a lot of the time, it causes problems. And so the healing process is about restoring the wisdom of what the nervous system really has known from birth, okay? And again, I believe, no, no study or no um, data behind this, but if our, regulate, our nervous system is more regulated more of the time, there's less vulnerability to recurrence of sexual acting out or any kind of sexual compulsivity. So the umbrella theme of today is that emotional sobriety and nervous system regulation are the two areas, two primary areas that reduce our vulnerability to recurrence. Okay, maybe if I go back to school and study it in, in some kind of doctoral program, um, I'll, I'll study this. this. This would be tops on my list to see what truly reduces vulnerability to recurrence. So let me share a little bit about my background with my nervous system. So, I was trained very traditionally as a therapist back in the late 80s, early 90s. And I was trained psychodynamically, I was trained family systems, but I was trained almost exclusively talk therapy, okay? And so my arc, I wanna say my healing arc, which personally and professionally, I, I would have to say it's been my healing arc, is moving from doing just talk therapy to a combination of talk therapy and somatic therapy, okay? And for me, it's somatic experiencing along with brain spotting. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about brain spotting, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on. So when I went into recovery back in 94, I was super intellectualized, like really in my head, like a talking head, you know? And, and, and unfortunately cut off from my feelings, what we would call frozen. And at that time, I, I think I came across and I think I tried to be emotionally in touch, but it was an uphill battle because I, I just had a lot of walls around me. And through my own therapy, through my 12 step work, through my training in both somatic experiencing and brain spotting, I finally realized, this is the good news, I finally realized that I had a body below my neck and, and a nervous system. And, and little by little by little, I began to thaw. So in our trainings, in those trainings, it's actually a wonderful thing. We get to practice on one another. And so I, I practiced for many years both modalities. And, and so I just started to thaw. I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was um, in a demonstration with a, um, one of the trainers in somatic experiencing. And we were talking about my aunt, who is one of my greatest resources. She's a really, really important person in my life. And 
I started talking about her and I, I got very teary, which I'm actually getting a little bit teary right now, but <clears throat> I'm not gonna go there entirely. Um, but what happened in the demo was I started sweating and I was sweating so much that my back was completely wet, like my shirt was soaked. And it sounds kind of um, uncomfortable, but it wasn't because literally I was thawing in front of the group. My aunt is a, a great resource for me. She's always been a source of love and a touchstone that I, main reason I moved out for, to California actually back in 88. And I mentioned this because my body woke up. I remember that like, like it was yesterday. And that was, I think, 2007. And so it's an example of how sometimes really positive charge can help us thaw. And sometimes when we release something that's really difficult and, and really heartbreaking, that can also be part of the thawing when we release and discharge what's stuck in the body. So for me, and for many of my clients, and I've seen people in program go through this, it's moving from inner frozenness to inner thawing, right? From feeling walled off from the people, from others and from the world to more vulnerability. So as a result, we're looking at feeling more available for intimacy. And like we were talking before in the antidotes to brokenheartedness, that feeling of an open channel of giving and receiving, that deeper connection, that feeling of being able to trust emotionally reliable people, right? So Peter Levine says that part of our somatic awareness, part of knowing what's going on in our body is what he calls the felt sense. And the felt sense is when we're able to track and identify sensations in our body. Now, it wasn't that long ago, 15 years ago, I, I could not track or identify a sensation in, in my body if you threw it at me. And through a lot of training and a lot of sessions, I, I, I've gotten to know my body, I'm still getting to know my body, but that's really the healing direction. That's the therapeutic direction right, is knowing what's happening in our body that we sometimes call somatic awareness. And I can't tell you how, how significant that is because so many of us who either come into the 12 step rooms or come into a therapy office for the first time, just are cut off from our bodies. And our body has so much information for us. Our body is so, has such wisdom, right? Restoring the wisdom of our nervous system. There was a book many years ago by a woman named Babette Rothschild. She's a psychologist and Dr. Rothschild called the book, The Body Remembers. And I love the name of the book because it really says it all. And I'm going to share a quote from a trainer from the somatic experiencing world which talks about this. This comes from Kathy Kane, who's a <clears throat> somatic experiencing trainer up in uh, the San Francisco area. She says, something bad happens. You don't know how to deal with it. It gets stuck inside of you. I'm gonna say that again. Something bad happens. You don't know how to deal with it. It gets stuck inside of you. So the way I think of it is that when something happens to us, and I'm talking about extreme heartbreak usually, right? Something that really impacts us, especially as a child, it's, it's way too much to process at the time. It's impossible because a child doesn't have the capacity to process what that's like to be able to, to truly work that through. You know, as adults, we have a little more opportunity, sometimes with talk therapy, sometimes with friends, sometimes with different uh, people in our life. <clears throat> but the, the, to go back to the title of this, The Body Remembers, 
it gets stored. The memories get stored, the experience gets stored. And it, somebody told me it's kind of like a Amazon warehouse. I've never been in an Amazon warehouse, but I imagine it's huge and has lots of shelves. And what happens is if something is too much to process at the time, it gets put on a shelf. And then later on, hopefully we can take it off the shelf and deal with it. But if, if too many things are on the shelf, that's when some problems start to happen, okay? Oh, <laughs> there comes the brain with the wheel. Sorry about that. I forgot that that was on this slide. <clears throat> All right, so this is the most technical slide of our presentation and it's not very technical. There's really two areas of the brain that I'm gonna focus on. One is the neocortex and one is the subcortex, okay? And this is how I describe this to clients and this is how I understand it easiest. The neocortex is where we spend most of the time maybe 95 to 100% of the, or at least 99% of the time. And it's our thinking brain. It's how we function. It's how we navigate the world. It's how we get through our days. That's the neocortex. The subcortex, on the other hand, is the emotional brain. And the emotional brain is where we store things that are too much to deal with at the time. So this is the Amazon warehouse image, okay? So what, what I said at the bottom square is that the subcortex is, is where trauma or brokenheartedness gets stored. Somatic therapies such as brain spotting and somatic experiencing access this part of the brain. And that's why they call them brain body modalities. Now, what I wanna say first of all is there's a bunch of somatic modalities out there and I believe in all of them. I think it's more important to find a clinician, a therapist who's really good at what they do rather than um, having to get too caught up on who does what because I think there's some wonderful EMDR folks out there, some terrific brain spotters, SE people, um, there's sensory motor psychotherapy folks. There's lots and lots of trainings and there's, they're all around the world. So personally, I think they all have something to offer. I just happen to gravitate towards these two trainings, which for me work really well together, okay? So that's a little bit about the neocortex and the subcortex. All righty, so what, what, what do we hear when we're hearing somebody talk about a dysregulated nervous system? So these are some examples. I feel so moody most of the time. Why do I always feel so worried and stressed out? My life looks okay on the outside, but on the inside, I feel like a wreck, right? So these are examples of dysregulation. Now, the therapeutic goal or the therapeutic direction is about creating somatic awareness to hopefully feel more like yourself more of the time, right? We can't feel completely like ourselves all of the time or we wouldn't be human, but to feel more like yourself more of the time, to move more from being walled off and frozen to feeling more thawed, to move more efficiently, more efficiently from dysregulation to regulation. We're gonna talk about that coming up very shortly. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about dysregulation because we all dysregulate at times, right? We're in traffic and we're running late for an appointment sometimes we get upset or maybe even road rage, right? That's dysregulation. Sometimes we don't wanna get out of bed in the morning. Maybe we've had a recent loss or maybe we're just, um, just wanna hibernate for whatever reason, we're depressed or, 
for avoiding something, that's dysregulation. But instead of getting stuck like quicksand in that dysregulation, we're really looking at how can the nervous system regulate more easily. And sometimes we can do some of that on our own and sometimes we need some help from others. It can happen both ways. All righty, so this is my absolute favorite slide of all time. So bear with me. It kind of goes along with what I was just saying. So I, I kind of uh, gave you a preview. My colleague, um, Elaine Miller Karras, leads a training here in Southern California called the Trauma Resource Model, which I trained in as well, partially. I didn't do the whole thing, but I did part of it. And Elaine gave me permission to modify her, her slide and make it my own. So I, I really wanna let you know that this is really Elaine's work and I just changed it a little bit. And um, if you ever want a, a really wonderfully structured and um, I think a, a very beneficial training, um, I think they're doing them by Zoom right now. So really, no matter where you are, you could consider training with Elaine miller Karras. Even if you just went for the first weekend, it's really beneficial. Um, so she calls this the window of tolerance. And some of you may have heard that before. For some reason, the window of tolerance never quite made sense to me. I kind of get it, but I call it the window of resilience. And the reason I call it the window of resilience is because in between those two dotted lines are really like the, the, um, the zone that we all wanna be in more of the time, right? The most uh, resilience, the most regulation, the most resourcefulness, it's, it's where we feel the, the capacity to be fully ourselves and to feel the full range of emotions and thoughts and, and images and memories, that's, that's between the two dotted lines, what I call the window of resilience. So that's kind of like the uh, place we want to land more times than not. But <laughs> life comes along and we bump out of it, right? We either bump up or we bump down but I'll start with bumping up. So bumping up is kind of like, imagine the accelerator on the car being stuck on high, right? It's revving really high, it's working really hard. And that's where sometimes we go into high anxiety and panic, restlessness, hypervigilance, a lot of irritability, and sometimes rage. And so that's an up, regulation, right? We sometimes call that an up regulation or a dysregulation up. When we bump out of the window of tolerance downward, that's a down regulation. And it's kind of like feeling stuck on low. So imagine a car that's just kind of revving really low. It almost sounds like it's gonna conk out on you, but it's, the, it's almost like the brake is on. And we all know this, at one time or another, we get depressed or disconnected, dissociative, numb, or just wiped out, exhausted, right? And th these are all natural responses actually to events in our life. But with the help of a somatically trained therapist, with the help of someone you trust, like a sponsor or a friend, or even a dog, we're gonna go over that in a moment. Um, the idea is to find our way back sooner rather than later, right? Without getting too stuck in the down regulation or too stuck in the up regulation. I know that for instance, I used to get really irritable sometimes for days and I couldn't get out of that moody place, irritable and shut down at the same time. So we can upregulate and downregulate simultaneously. Um, but that was before program and that was before I learned about my nervous system. So 
um, again, for, for any of you who are interested in learning about regulating your nervous system, um, some of the best books I would say are, are by, uh, one is by Peter Levine. Um, you may have heard of it. It's called Waking the Tiger, Waking the Tiger. Um, David Grand wrote the Brain Spotting book, which is really an easy read. And if you have any interest in brain spotting, I wrote, I, I actually read it on a, um, a plane ride from the East Coast, West Coast to the East Coast. And I'm not a fast reader, but I, I was just, it was an easy read. Um, there's also a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And that's by Bessel van der Kolk, which I can spell later if, you, if you're interested. But, but I'm mentioning all of this because anything that helps raise your awareness, anything that helps you or your clients work with their nervous system and their bodies, um, sometimes just psychoeducation can make a big difference. So I'll end there. That's my window of resilience slide. And hopefully you all have access to a copy of this, the slides today because uh, this will be in there. All righty, so like we did with the story of Jason, I'm going to talk about the story of Debbie. And this is about Debbie's dysregulated nervous system. When I first spoke to Debbie on the phone, she said she was losing sleep, but wouldn't say more. When we first met in person, eye contact was minimal and her posture was poor. I've seen this many times. It's almost always related to trauma, shame, and helplessness. During the appointment, Debbie barely looked up to see me as if she was wondering whether it was safe enough to be herself and share her whole story. She was in her early 30s and her capacity for real connection had been severely limited. I reassured her she could say as much or as little as she wanted, and we would get to know her nervous system through feelings, thoughts, sensations, images, and memories. Sometimes words were helpful, but oftentimes slowing down and building somatic awareness in the here and now would be our primary focus. Over time, Debbie opened up about the challenges she was facing. She disclosed that she used to have sex almost every day. And when she wasn't with a partner, she masturbated compulsively, sometimes to the point of self-injury. Currently, she struggles with flashbacks and nightmares. She also had acute anxiety, especially in dark places like movie theaters. Little by little, Debbie shared the depth of her brokenheartedness. She was anally penetrated by a male teenager, sorry, teenage babysitter when she was seven years old. And a gym teacher exposed himself to her multiple times when she was 14. From the time she was old enough to talk, Debbie's parents had told her she was a very beautiful girl. Unfortunately, her mom grew highly envious of her beauty and became extremely critical, even suggesting she had seduced the boy and the teacher. Instead of feeling protected by her parents, she felt alienated, abandoned, and profoundly misunderstood. When she hit puberty, Debbie had lots of sexual fantasies of men and women that felt confusing, overwhelming, and overstimulating. Due to the experience with her babysitter, sex terrified and excited her at the same time. She tried to downplay her looks by wearing baggy black clothes, but still received lots of sexual attention from both men and women. By the time she moved away for college, Debbie was having sex with men and women multiple times a week, sometimes multiple times a day, and it was becoming riskier involving anonymous sex and public liaisons. On the one hand, the validation felt intoxicating, but at the same time, it left her feeling lonely and hollow. She knew the sex medicated residual pain from her childhood trauma, but her nervous system was getting worn down, resulting in panic attacks, insomnia, and dissociation. 
Through therapy, she began to gain awareness of when she felt regulated or dysregulated. This awareness empowered her. She felt hopeful to no longer be at the mercy of her traumatic past. When she found a pleasant memory of a relationship that felt calm and grounding, we would pause to help her nervous system experience a deeper sense of safety. Discovering both internal and external resources is crucial to sustainable healing. Our therapeutic relationship became one of her resources, both in the office and during the week, as she began to trust that collaboratively we could heal her nervous system. So that's the story of Debbie. It's so interesting. I, I Even though it's a composite case study, I, I feel like I know her because I've been spending the last few years with these studies or what I call case studies. And the one thing that pops out at me this time that I wanted to emphasize is that when she realized when she was regulated or dysregulated, she felt empowered. She felt like somehow she had some agency over her body because she was really at the mercy of the insomnia and the panic attacks and the, the dissociation. But when she was able to even identify when she was regulated and dysregulated, which took her months and months to do, by the way, it became something that was a resource for her because internally she could depend on it herself, right? And she would come in and, and, and say things to me um, like, you know, I, this week, I realized that I, when I dissociated, I didn't have to stay there, that I knew how to ground myself, right? So that's what we're looking for is, is helping clients, helping ourselves, helping our, our fellow program people be able to feel more empowered and less at the mercy of what, what's happening to them. She also, just like with Jason, the story of Jason, trust was huge for Debbie, right? So, so for her to be able to trust me, what she liked, and in retrospect, this is kind of what um, several people have said to me, is that I, I, I really said to them, you don't have to use any words if you don't want to. We can just sit here and notice what's happening um, and, and just, be observers. You know, I always say, can we observe with curiosity? Can we observe what's happening with curiosity and non-judgmentally, right? And so I try to do that for myself. I try to observe my body, my nervous system with curiosity, and I try not to judge what's coming up because I still have a lot of healing to do. And I think it's lifelong, actually, for, for all of us but I try and have self-compassion. And that's really what I think this particular illustration is about, is, is moving from frozenness to thawing and moving from, in her case, self-judgment, because that's what she got from her mom, to self-compassion, okay? So that's a little bit about the story of, of Debbie. Andrew, can you quickly go through the authors again and the books? Sure, sure. Thank you. The first is Peter Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, -E, Waking the Tiger. And that's uh, really all about somatic experiencing. The second one is by David Grand, G-R-A-N-D. And it's simply called brain spotting. And it kind of tells the story of how he discovered brain spotting and how it works. And um, like I said, I'm a little biased, I have to say. I like Peter quite a bit. I think he's brilliant. I think that um, David's a better writer. <laughs> and I say that only because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a slow reader and I was just so taken by um, the way David Grand put together his book. And then the other person who's quite well known is Bessel, B-E-S-S-E-L. 
Van der Kolk, V-A-N-D-E-R-K-O-L-K. -E and he wrote, um, The Body Keeps the Score. Okay, those are just three resources. There's, there's more. And by the way, at the end of today's presentation, you're gonna see my contact information. And even if you don't have questions that you wanna ask in, in during our time together, feel free to email me at any time. I'm happy to be a resource for you, whether it's um, looking for resources in Los Angeles or curious about um, you know, somatic approaches, somatic trainings, et cetera, somatic therapists. But yeah, th thank you for that, uh, Leah. Okay, so moving forward. Nope, that's backwards. Um, here we go. Some of you may have heard this sentence before, but I think this is kind of a miracle. This was something that was said by Donald Hebb in 1949, which is kind of unbelievable to me, but what he said was neurons that fire together wire together. And the reason why it's kind of a miracle is because it's like a half decade ahead of its time. I mean, it's just so, what a pioneer to even come up with this. And what I wrote at the bottom is that the well-worn path the well-worn path is the compulsive, addictive type behaviors, right? And when we do something over and over and over, it, it's what we call neuroplasticity, which is that the brain kind of creates that pathway and that's what we get used to, right? That's kind of like, I, I think of it sometimes as if any of you are familiar with the, um, what is it called? The bobsled run in the, in the Olympics. It's like that groove that the bobsled goes down is kind of like the well-worn path, right? And so the compulsive addictive tendencies uh, create that neuroplasticity of going down there again and again and again. But the, the, the cool thing is that we didn't know about till fairly recently, is that we can establish new neural pathways, right? So if we're used to compulsive tendencies, little by little by little, our brain will be able to identify, oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking a sober path. I'm choosing not to go down that bobsled run. I'm gonna take a different bobsled run. I hope that image makes sense to everybody. Um, but that's amazing. Like we can teach an old dog new tricks. So even though there's a lot of recidivism out there and a lot of recurrence of sexually compulsive behaviors, we all have the opportunity and the possibilities to establish new pathways. So for instance, it could be a pathway of gratitude. That's one thing we know. Um, helps our mood, helps our um, sense of well-being, our sense of life satisfaction. That's a good example of something we can do as part of our recovery or our, our healing, okay? So that's a little bit about how the brain can establish new bobsled runs or new pathways. So this is really important. Any compulsive behavior, in this case, sexually compulsive behavior, are really an attempt to regulate the nervous system, right? They're an attempt to, to feel better. But what happens is that they're just short term. They're not sustainable. So even though initially they, they might serve a purpose, they might, might actually be a survival strategy, right? What happens is, is that like I say on the right-hand side, it's a misfired attempt to regulate the nervous system. So at first it kind of works. At first it might get us out of our pain, it might distract us, it might initially help us feel better. But what I say at the bottom here on the left is that 
sexually compulsive behaviors are an attempt, an attempt to feel better sometimes, an attempt sometimes to feel less, or sometimes to feel more, right? Isn't that interesting? So, so it's, it can be in any direction. So let's say somebody is feeling kind of deadness within themselves, right? They're feeling flat, they're feeling depressed. Maybe they get a rush or this adrenaline charge to feel more, right? That's an attempt to feel better, right? Or let's say somebody is heartbroken over a breakup, right? So instead of dealing with the feelings of the breakup, the grief of, of saying goodbye to, to, to someone, they act out to try and feel better. And maybe in the short term, it kind of works, but in the long term, of course it doesn't. So just to keep in mind that sexually compulsive behavior can have different reasons behind it. And it's always, I think, helpful to ask ourselves and ask others, what, what, what is it that it's really doing for you? Or what did it do for you in the past? Is, did, did it help you feel better? Did it help you feel less? Or did it help you feel more? Or maybe all of the above, I don't know. But it's a misfired attempt to regulate the nervous system. That's the, uh, the summary here. All right. Okay, so as promised, Leah, <laughs> uh, this is my dog, Bowie. This is shortly after we adopted him or he adopted us, I should say. But Bowie is a Cocker Spaniel mix. He's, it was so funny when we did the DNA test, because we're always curious when we adopt, um, our dogs, you know, what, what, what the heck is he? And it came out as mostly Cocker Spaniel mix with something like undifferentiated other breeds. They couldn't tell us what the other mix was. So anyway, he's, he's incredibly cute. And as you can tell, um, just like with Rose and Nikki at the beginning of our presentation, Bowie's a regulator for me. He, just by looking at him, you know, I'm at the office right now, I'm not at home, but I just get excited to, to see him tonight because as we know, pets are incredibly unconditional and they really, their nervous system gets regulated through us and our, sorry, our nervous system gets regulated through them so that's what we call co-regulation. When we're with someone or a pet that we really trust and relax with, and Bowie is 24 seven entertainment, I get to play, we get to play together and I get to act like a kid and roll around on the floor with him and all of that. Um, it's co-regulating, it's co-regulating. I, I, um, I feel so grateful. I mean, the depth of gratitude I have for this little guy is unbelievable because I need something to counterbalance um, for me what's being way too serious in my life. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a hard worker, but I'm just way too serious. And, I, and I'm always looking for ways to, like I said before, relax and regulate. So what I said about co-regulation and connection is that they, they really go together, that when we're feeling deeply connected to another, that's when our nervous system feels more regulated. So for instance, if I'm feeling upset about something and I'm dysregulated about whatever happened that day, I know in my life who those regulating people are. And hopefully, in addition to Bowie, I don't wanna leave him out, but I know who to call. Like I know who to text, I know, at this point in my life who helps me regulate. And I really encourage you to think about who are those regulators in your life? You know, are they uh, a, a pet? Are they a, um, a person that you trust deeply? And so just some examples that I highlight here are 12 step meetings. Hopefully, if you have found one that works for you and you like 12 step um, can be absolutely regulating. Absolutely. Hopefully, 
um, coming out of a, um, a meeting, you'll feel more regulated than you went into a meeting, right? And, and that for me is sometimes just feeling more grounded, feeling more connected, feeling more sense of belonging and part of community, right? It doesn't even have to do sometimes with what's being said at the meeting. There's just something about me providing that space to know that that's a, a safe place for me to be myself. And personally, I, I am a big fan of retreats. And the reason I love retreats, and for me, it's been 12-step retreats, but really any retreat, is that it's unplugging, right? Whether it's a weekend or a week. I, I know my therapist goes to meditation retreats for two weeks at a time, which is kind of amazing. But retreats really help us get back in touch with ourselves. It's getting away from all the distraction and it's finding that place, hopefully externally, but internally, that we get to slow down and, and truly relax. And out here in Los Angeles, we haven't been able to have a retreat uh, since the pandemic, but we had three retreats a year. And so I've been to probably 25 to 30 retreats um, over the years. And to say that they've been a touchstone and a pillar of my own recovery would be um, an understatement. It's been an incredible place for me to, um, to really grapple with with my own spirituality and my own sense of, of connection, right? So hopefully, hopefully at some point we'll get back to the time when we can have our retreats again. All right. So let me see if my, my images are gonna work here. Oh, good. Here comes the dolphin. Here comes the shark. And here comes the tuna. Okay, so um, Chelly Campbell is a, a colleague of mine out here in Los Angeles. And Chelly wrote a book many years ago called The Wealthy Spirit. And The Wealthy Spirit, by the way, is a really fun page a day book if you're interested in financial awareness with an entertaining um, kind of uh, approach. Um, Chelly used to be an actress and now she does financial stress reduction workshops for many years. I went to one, I don't know, 20 years ago. And Chelly gave, gave me permission to talk about the dolphins, the sharks and the tuna. And what Chelly says, and I love this, it's so simple, but I, I really like this. She said, you know, there's your people and there's the rest of the world. And it's your job in life to find your people and to cultivate those relationships. And what I love about that is in some ways it's so simple, but it's taken me a long time to really identify who my dolphin sharks and tuna truly are. So I'm gonna talk mostly about swimming with the dolphins, but I'll mention the shark and the tuna in a moment. So as most of you know, dolphins are amazing. They're probably, in my opinion, more sophisticated than human beings um, in the sense that they are so communal, right? There's so much about connection. They're emotionally reliable to one another. They communicate really beautifully and effectively. They like to have fun. They like to play. They like to have sex. They're one of the few mammals or, yeah, mammals that, that enjoy sex for pleasure. They're absolutely loyal to one another. And they have each other's back. If somebody's sick, somebody, if, if a dolphin is, is sick or possibly dying, they stay with it, right? So they're kind of amazing um, in terms of how they travel through the world, literally in pods and how they look after each other. I mean, they're really like the role models of connection for us. 
Now, there are sharks out there, as we know. We, I'm not gonna go into who your sharks are. You probably know who your sharks are. And then tuna are kind of like the codependent people in your life, the ones who are like, they glom on to you, they're, they're needy, that, you know, they've just got that um, feeling of, of somehow wanting something from you all the time. And so we all have, this is the important point, they all have dolphin, we all have dolphins, shark and tuna within us. We all have them, it's just part of being human. But we want to cultivate the dolphin in us. We want to notice when the shark is coming out and hopefully come back to the dolphin. And the same with the tuna. We, when that shows up, we want to be more dolphin-like, right? Now, you've probably heard this before, but I love this expression. We, as human beings, are biologically wired for connection. We didn't always know this. We did not always know that we're biologically wired for connection. Now through research and through our understanding of our brain, we know that we're biologically wired for connection. So it's not an option. Connection is not an option, it's, it's, it's essential. It's part of our life energy and it's part of how we thrive. So keep that in mind that we're not just talking about some kind of hors d'oeuvre, we're talking about something to consider all the time. All right. Okay. There is a colleague of mine named Phil Flores. And Phil Flores wrote a book maybe 20 years ago called Addiction, sorry, I'm gonna get this backwards. Um, Addiction as an attachment disorder. Addiction as an attachment disorder. And I, when I heard about that book, I thought, wow, because it was, I think around 2003 that it came out. And I had never heard somebody focus exclusively at that time on how attachment is so intertwined with addictive compulsive tendencies. And so some of this is, is borrowed from Phil Flores. By the way, the book is, is a little dense. It's a textbook. Um, so I'm not recommending necessarily the book as a resource, but I think he was actually a pioneer in helping us put together addiction, uh, at, um, compulsion, and attachment. He was talking more about drug and alcohol, but it all relates to sexual compulsivity as well. So what I used to think what I used to think that I was supposed to do, and this is from the 90s, is that somehow my job as therapist was to help my clients build secure attachments and that the, the secure attachment had to start with me. That if they had very you know, avoidant attachment style or, or anxious attachment style or disorganized attachment style, that it was really my mandate to help them get a secure attachment. What I learned and what I really believe in is that for me, it's about helping my clients reduce the barriers, the barriers that they have, that they built up against secure attachment. So we all, let's just get real here. We all have barriers to secure attachment. It's, it's part of life, whether we're in a compulsive cycle or a normie, um, we all have barriers to secure attachment or to deeper connection or to um, intimacy. It's just part of the human condition. But what's important is, is that we look at the barriers, we identify what's getting in the way. What are the walls that I have up? What is it that I'm protecting myself from, right? That's the hard work is knowing when the barriers are up and starting to identify, oh, okay, so that's just a way of me protecting myself. So what do I do with that? I, I go to therapy, I go to 12 step, I, I, I talk about it, I read about it, I pray about it, what, whatever it takes to really pay attention to what those barriers are. And in the psychoanalytic world, this is what they say at the bottom. As 
human beings were most defended against our greatest needs. I'll say that again. As human beings were most defended against our greatest needs. So what's so ironic and kind of bittersweet about that is we all want love. We all want connection. We all want intimacy, but we're all scared, right? In one way or another, we're all self-protected. We all defend ourselves. So part of the, the healing direction is number one, knowing that, like I said before, but number two, challenging that and saying, what, what can I do to build more capacity for love? What can I do to build more capacity for giving and receiving loving people in my life, right? And that to me is, is a lifelong challenge. Okay, so here are the summary points to keep in mind about nervous system regulation. Hopefully, like I said, hopefully we're reducing the vulnerability to recurrence of sexually compulsive behaviors, right? And, and I think everybody knows this, but recurrence is part of recovery. You know, people talk about relapse as part of recovery. Well, I'm using the word recurrence. Recurrence is part of recovery. It's not the recurrence that matters. It's how we deal with it. It's how we deal with it. If we get off course in any way in our life, how do we get back on course quicker and more efficiently without hopefully too much damage or, or pain? Just like we talked about with the story of Debbie, psychoeducation regulates the nervous system. So if we go back to that slide with the window of resilience, just, un un just understanding that slide, I see my clients already taking a, a deep breath. I see them exhaling and say, Andrew, nobody ever told me that before. Oh my gosh, I, 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 I get it. I see what I do. And I'm, I'm excited and hopeful that, that there's something I can do to be more regulated more of the time. I believe that two, two really great sources of nervous system regulation are in the therapy office and in the 12 step rooms. There's lots of other places where we can get nervous system regulation. It could be in your place of worship. It could be with your dog, your cat, but therapy and 12 step tend to be two major sources of regulating the nervous system. And like I said, moving from dysregulation to regulation is not a finite experience. It's a practice right? It's a, a daily practice and a lifelong challenge and opportunity to really find what it means to be more yourself more of the time. So this slide was taken in Philadelphia. And for any of you who happen to know Philadelphia, this is on Ben Franklin Parkway, a few blocks away from the steps to the art museum where Rocky ran up the steps back, I guess it was the late 70s that Rocky came out. But this is a newer statue that came out and it says amor. And for those of you who don't know what amor means, it's, it's love in Spanish. And at, at the time, I didn't know why I wanted the picture taken of me underneath of it. You can tell it's like the middle of the winter there. Um, this was a few years back, but it's perfect because that's really what this presentation is about, Amor, because love regulates the nervous system. Intimacy regulates the nervous system. Cultivating relationships with emotionally reliable people regulates the nervous system. Pets regulate the nervous system. It goes on and on. So regulation is actually all around us and it's also inside of us. So I will 
wind down by saying, oh, there's Johan Hari's uh, spelling, um, by saying once again, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And I'm going to say that slightly different. The opposite of sexual compulsivity isn't sobriety. The opposite of sexual compulsivity is connection. This is my contact information. My website is very informative. If you want to check out my podcast, my blog posts, um, all kinds of stuff is located there. And like I said, if you want to email me, you can e email me through my website. You can call me. I'm, I'm happy to be a resource for, for any of you. Um, and I really, really appreciate you all being here. I guess we're going to shift into any questions that came up. One question I see is about Elaine Miller Karras, Karras? Yes. Asking if she has a program for further understanding of regulating the nervous system. Thank you for the question. Elaine is really a, a wonderful, wonderful teacher on the nervous system. She comes from a background in somatic experiencing and EMDR. And she took all of her knowledge and put it into her training, which is called the trauma, research, re, trauma resource model. Um, I call it TRIM for short. That's what we call it out here. And so, yes, Elaine Miller Karras um, absolutely is one of the best teachers out there. And it's actually a really wonderful introductory way of understanding the nervous system because she focuses on resource. That's why it's in the name of her, her, um, her training. And so resourcing without going into a whole lot of detail, it's really about finding what helps you feel calm and, and relaxed and grounded from the inside out, really. Like what are your internal resources and what are your external resources? So she uses resourcing as a core part of her model. And she's very easy to understand. I mean, she has a whole um, faculty nowadays, so it may not be her teaching, but she has wonderful teachers out there and very, um, her materials are excellent. They're very structured and easy to understand. So I, I really recommend her training. If I were to do it all over again, I probably would have done her training first. I actually did it last, but uh, there's no particular order, but I think she's, she's terrific. Will you spell her last name, please? Yeah, um, Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R hyphen Karras, K-A-R-A-S. So Elaine Miller Karras. Thank you. And for those of you that didn't see it, Phil Flores that Andrew was mentioning his book, Addiction as an Attachment Disorder. And you're quite right. It is a tome. <laughs> I know, <laughs> Dr. Flores. Um, I've added his uh, website in the chat. If you want to click on that, it'll take you to his website and tell you a little bit about him. He's from my hometown here in Georgia. So uh, I've known him for quite a while. Interesting. He's very active in the American Group Psychotherapy Association. So I've known him for many years from um, that organization. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I don't see any other questions unless other folks have something um, that is coming up. Let me see this. That was just the one about uh, Karis's last name. So we got that handled. Andrew, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Really appreciate you being here and talking. And um, I just really appreciate you always being a part of SASH and presenting for us. My pleasure, Leah. I'm always available and I'm just so grateful to Sash as one of my professional homes now. <laughs>